Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all here tonight to MTRI's April Sitback Seminar. My name is Chad Simmons. I'm the Communication Officer and Terrestrial Ecologist at the Mersey Tobiotic Research Institute. But before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting here today in Gespelik, one of seven districts of Mi'kmaq, homeland to the Mi'kmaq people. And I want to acknowledge the treaties of peace and friendship and thank the Mi'kmaq people for their generosity in sharing their homeland with us. So for anyone who's unaware, the Mercy Tobiotic Research Institute is a research-based nonprofit nestled in Southwest Nova Scotia near Kejimakujik National Park and historic site. And our mission is to promote, conserve and sustain biodiversity in Gespuwik as well as beyond. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce MTRI's own staff member, Lori Finney. Uh, Lori just graduated from the University of Waterloo with her Master's of Science. So next, I'm going to hand it over to Lori, um, but I'd just like to remind everyone to please keep their mics muted. And if you have any questions during the uh, chat, you can just um, type them into the chat and we'll answer them as they come up or at the end. So Lori, with that, if you'd like to begin. Hi everyone, just give me a minute to share my presentation. Chat is my screen good? Can you give me a thumbs up? Okay, perfect. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, like Chad said, my name is Lori um, and I work at MTRI and I've been there since around 2016. And um, more recently, I did a master's project in, collabor in collaboration with MTRI to study bats. And so I'm gonna tell you a bit about what I found today, but also I really want you to take away, um, hopefully some new information about bats that you can find um, potentially in your own backyard in Nova Scotia. Uh, so let's start off with species of bats in Nova Scotia. So in Atlantic Canada, uh, there's been seven bats, uh, different types of bats documented uh, across the region. And all of those have been previously documented in Nova Scotia. But there's some that are more common than others. And it's taken a lot of research to kind of figure out uh, which species are most abundant. And so the really neat thing that's kind of come out of a lot of this research um, is that we've learned um, kind of which ones are more common and it's led to better protection of bats as we have learned more about them. And so here are the seven species that have been documented, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about each one of those. So our most common bats in Nova Scotia are our hibernating bats. And so what's special about them is that they don't leave the province. They typically stay here year round. And what they're going to do during the winter is hibernate. Um, they'll lower their body temperature, low, lower their physiological state to conserve energy and they'll stay put while it's cold. And then once it warms up, they kind of go across the province and what they'll do is they'll form uh, groups of female bats um, known as maternity colonies, which consist of, of the female adults and they'll have their pups together. And so our hibernating species are the most common and those three species are pictured here, the little brown myotis, also sometimes called the little brown bat, the northern myotis, also sometimes called the northern long-eared bat, and the tricolor bat, which doesn't really have another name. So, uh, so these are the most abundant. The most common uh, among the three, they're kind of listed in most common to least common is the little brown myotis. And so those common features are they're forming, forming those maternity colonies. Um, and the other neat thing is that they rely on a network of roots. So during the summer, um, some of the places they use, they typically don't rely on one, they rely on multiple. So that could be multiple trees, multiple buildings and they typically switch roofs every few days. And so um, they're really reliant on, on a large area to, to support themselves. Now I'm gonna highlight the most common bat. So not only is this the most common bat in Nova Scotia, but across Canada. And so uh, if you've ever encountered a bat, there's a very high chance that it was probably this one. Um, and the reason for that is because we have the closest relationship with them. 
they are the ones that love to use human-made structures, so anthropogenic, anthropogenic structures, and they're also appropriately named. They're little and they're a brown bat. Um, so the size of them, 7.9 grams is the average, so they're pretty light, and their length is really, really small, so they're only about this long, but when they have their wings out, kind of in this bottom picture here, it makes them look a lot bigger, but in reality, they're, they're quite little tiny creatures. They're generalists, they eat a variety of insects, so they can be found eating moths, beetles, mayflies, etc. And when they have their young, um, typically that's in June and July, and it takes about three weeks for their young to grow up. And so those are a few little things about our most common bat. In comparison to our other two hibernating species, um, the northern, my northern myotis is the most second most common. And when you compare those two, they look really similar. It, this one actually looks like a little brown bat as well, basically. I know this photo probably makes it look a little bit more gray than it actually is. Um, but one of the biggest differences is their, their ears. They have a lot longer ears. And the tragus, which is this little ear bone, if you look at your ear and you look at the little ear flap here, um, we have it as well. Their tragus is a lot more long and slender um, in comparison to the little brown bat. They're also um, different in the way that they select different roofs. So this species is often not found using human structures. So they're not gonna be seen often in a bat box or, or your shed. Uh, they're gonna be found in tree roofs. So they really rely on a healthy forest um, for their, their summer roofs. And while they're in the forest, what they'll do is they'll glean on insects. So, so they'll also catch insects in the air. And I'm gonna show you a really cool video later of a bat um, feeding. What they'll do is they'll kind of pick insects off, uh, off leaves and trees, uh, which is pretty neat. Uh, so the third most common bat we have in the province is the tricolored bat. And compared to the past two I just talked about, um, this one also hibernates, is that this one's a lot smaller. But I think that's pretty hard to tell unless you kind of had them all lined up beside each other. And so it's lighter, its wingspan is smaller, and it also has uh, different roosting habits than the other two. Here are some photos on the left. Um, so I have a picture of a tricolored bat roost. The top image is of a spruce tree and um, a lichen that we often call old man's beard. The genus name is Usnia. And so what this bat specializes in is roosting in groups, sometimes up to 18 individuals and a clump of lichen on a tree, which is pretty unique. This is actually so unique that it doesn't even do this in other parts of its range. So in the States, um, we see this bat use other things such as leaves, moss, et cetera. So very unique overall and very uh, uh, makes them kind of special, I guess. Um, there's another image below, kind of a black and white image showing uh, the bats kind of clumped together because it's really hard to tell from far away. So, so bats that roost in, in natural stu structures are a lot harder to detect than um, in human-made structures because we're often more closer to those in our homes. It's easier for us to encounter them and, and bats can roost quite high up in trees, which makes them harder to detect. One more fact about these bats is that they're mainly restricted to the southwestern part of Nova Scotia. And so there's very few uh, sightings or documentations of them outside of southwest Nova Scotia. And here's um, the estimated range of them um, in this part of the province. Now I'm going to get to the bats that we don't see most often. And some differences between these bats and the last group of bats I talked about is some of them are more colorful. They're also a lot bigger and we have very few sightings of them. Um, so there's no significant populations, and those um, that are migratory are the hoary bat, the silver-haired bat, and the eastern red bat. And so those species, what they do is they only are here uh, when it's warm. So once it turns cold, they tend to go to kind of the southern United States, sometimes Mexico, and spend the winter there. And so these species are different in how they spend their time here. Um, they also don't really breed here. We only have very few records. The first record of silver-haired bats breeding in Atlantic Canada was actually last summer in 2020 in New Brunswick. Uh, you might be able to find a recent article in the news about that. Uh, we have one breeding record of the red bat in Nova Scotia, Naramath County. I think it was in like 2001. And I don't think there's any, I haven't seen any records of hoary bats breeding uh, in Nova Scotia. So um, they're coming here, hanging out, <laughs> and then leaving. And so when they're leaving in the fall is when we most often see them. So a lot of our records of of these bats are kind of offshore, coastal sightings, sometimes on ships. The last one I'm gonna talk about is the brown bat, the one that we most 
least often see. Um, we see a few more in New Brunswick compared to Nova Scotia. And uh, this bat, I would compare it to be more similar to the other brown bats I talked about, the hibernating species. So this one hibernates. Um, one thing I didn't mention about the migratory species is they are more solitary, so they are more often alone. Like when they have their, pup, their pups, they more often don't form maternity colonies of female bats. Um, and they, they like to roost in trees, so they're more often in trees than in buildings. And so with the big brown bat, uh, they're more similar to the other hibernating species than these migratory ones, but again, not very common. So then I've kind of told you about which ones are more common or not. Let's put some numbers to uh, those bats. So bat populations are really hard to study. Um, one of the biggest reasons is that they're active at night. Uh, they're quite elusive and they emit sounds outside of our hearing range, which I'm really gonna talk a lot about today. Okay. And so with them being so difficult to study, it's really hard to get numbers on them. So they might be roosting in trees really high up. They might be roosting in crevices when they're hibernating. And so you just can't really get a good idea of how many bats there are. Some estimates think that across Canada, there's probably a million of each myotis bat. So that being the little brown bat and the northern long ear bat or the northern myotis. I'll kind of use those names inter interchangeably. Um, and in Nova Scotia, um, previous estimates, I'm going to say before 2011-2010 uh, era, um, we estimated about 15,000 hibernating bats in Nova Scotia. And from that, um, we estimated that there might be a few hundred thousand uh, bats of that species. And so what I'm getting at here is that historically, um, in the 90s, early 2000s, we were seeing lots of bats and they were everywhere. And so they were a common thing that most people had had an encounter with during that time. And if you were seeing a bat, it was most likely going to be the hibernating species. And so just to put some numbers to how many times we've seen the migratory bats, 65 in total for all three of those species. And for the big brown bat, only two sightings. And so for the big brown bat, the most recent one was in 2017 at the Oxford frozen food plant. And then the other one was in the 90s um, in, during a, a count at the hibernation site. Um, so I'm, so I'm kind of showing you some photos and some illustrations here, but I want to keep in mind that theme of bats being hard to study. And this is really going to show you that. So most of your encounters, um, are probably going to be brief with bats. So they're out flying at night. They're very elusive. They're very fast. And this is what a bat signing probably will look like. Um, so the image here on the, the left, um, kind of between the two buildings, looks like there's probably a bat flying there and same on the right. And so these are sightings that were submitted to the provincial, uh, website batconservation.ca that MTRI um, helps manage with uh, Nova Scotia Department's lands and forests. And this is to help to conserve bats and study them and learn more about where people are seeing them. And so this is a great way for you to support bats, um, but just keep in mind that sometimes you're not even gonna know if you saw a bat because it's so, it's so quick and it can be quite hard. Maybe it was a bird, hard to say. We do get some interesting reports that it's hard to say if it actually was a bat or not. So if you're lucky though, uh, you might have uh, a closer encounter um, where you can kind of get some features that tell the difference between all the bats I've just shown you. And so fur color is a great way. Um, and thinking about the things I've told you about which ones you're more likely to see um, can tell you a lot about potentially uh, what species it is. And so if you see brown fur, really good chance it's one of those little brown bats. Um, if you see red or silver haired, it gives you a really good indication that it's one of those more rare migratory bats. They're also, the migratory bats are a lot bigger. I have a photo here, um, bottom uh, middle photo, showing a hoary bat on the left and a little brown bat on the right. And the hoary bat is almost twice the size of the little brown bat, which you can kind of tell from the photo. Bat biologists, what we'll do though, is for some of those species that look really similar, is we take special measurements of their, of their forearm length, and we also look at their ear shape. And so um, the northern long ear bat has a really long, long tragus and a really long ear. And so there's certain measurements that we would expect um, for those ears um, to be able to tell the difference between say that species and a very similar looking species, the little brown bat. And so I have a diagram here. Uh, the top left drawing is of the Northern myotis bat and the top right is of the tricolor bat. And if you look at their ears, you can see one's quite a bit longer than the long ear bat. And the tricolor bat has more of a, a shorter ear and not as pointy tragus. But the other thing we can do uh, to tell species apart is to use acoustics. And so um, that's something that I've spent a lot of time on and I'm gonna tell you a lot more about today. 
before we get into that, um, <laughs> we uh, have a few techniques that we uh, rely on to study bats. And so if you think of things that you've heard about different researchers, um, sometimes we catch wildlife, sometimes we just visually observe them. And so we combine techniques to get a full picture of how bats are doing. And so some of that can look like roost count. So looking inside a spot where bats are roosting, whether it's your shed or your attic. Um, here pictured on the left is a bat box and a bunch of myotis bats roosting inside. And so what researchers and citizen sciences scientists and anyone can do is kind of count them as they leave and get a really good idea of how many bats are actually there and then track that over time. And we also catch bats. Um, so pictured here on the right uh, are two poles and in between them is a really fine net that you can't really pick up in a picture. And what we'll do is we'll catch bats and then we can get more specific, specific information on individuals. Um, is it male or female? What is the age of the bat? Um, is it juvenile or adult? Um, we can also collect samples to do things like look at um, isotopes, mercury, um, a variety of things. But what really helps is when people like you are involved and do reports of bats and contribute to community science. So of these techniques, acoustics has really been really valuable to the study of bats. And the reason for that is some of the things I've highlighted like them being difficult to study. And so what acoustics looks like is pairing uh, a recording device um, with a microphone and deploying in an area to record their vocalizations. So what you wanna do is detect um, the howl of a wolf, um, the cry of a bird or something. You, you're looking at studying wildlife and you're trying to get those different vocalizations which tell you about the behavior of the animal. And so um, if a bird's singing, uh, potentially it's looking for a mate. And for bats, we can do the same thing um, by looking at their different vocalizations uh, we can learn more about them. The thing with bats though, is that some of the vocalizations, vocalizations that they make are their calls. Um, a lot of you probably know that bats uh, echolocate, is that some of those we can't hear with our ears. And so we really rely on acoustics to detect those. So whereas other wildlife, we can hear it with our ears, their, their vocalizations are in our hearing range. These devices really help us pick up those sounds. And so what an acoustic device can look like are these two pictures. So here on the left at the top um, is one that you can buy yourself. Uh, it's pretty expensive. It's a few hundred dollars um, at Wildlife Acoustics. And so it's an attachment to your phone. Um, and then when a bat's flying around in the evening, um, this device can pick that up. And then it gives you a guess as to what type of bat is flying around for you. I'm going to show you though, um, what different bat voices look like actually though. So we'll get to that soon. The device below is called an audio moth and it's a lot more affordable. Um, it's under a hundred dollars uh, for anyone to purchase. And so this device, um, you can't get a live um, identification of the bat from the device, but you can look at the recordings later on that that you pick up um, and kind of figure out potentially what bats are, are in your area. And so these are these are publicly available to uh, for people to use. So why can't we hear all bat vocalizations? Well, our hearing range is highlighted here in the orange from 20 hertz to 20 uh, kilohertz. And so with that hearing range, um, we're limited compared to some other wildlife. So you can see um, uh, elephants can emit sounds below our hearing range and cats and dogs can, and can hear uh, sounds above our hearing range. So sometimes your dog might be a little bit more responsive to things going on than you. And so if you look at that orange, uh, area where we can hear, and then you look at the pink line or purple line down at the bottom, you can see that bats um, have quite a larger range than us. And so there's a big whole wide world of sounds going on outside of our hearing range. And so uh, acoustic devices allowed us to detect in that, in that range of sounds. So if you're out in the evening, um, this is what the night sky might look like. And if there's a bat flying around, you may have no idea because some of the sounds they emit, especially when they're eating or out foraging, looking for bugs, we can't hear. And so um, if you have your sound on, um, I hope this isn't too loud when I'm playing it. I'm going to play what a bat vocalization uh, would sound like um, if you were out in the night and we could actually hear it. Okay, so um, kind of sounds chirpy, I would describe it as. And um, although we wouldn't be able to hear that in person um, because it's ultrasonic above our hearing range, um, it's chirpy, it's frequent. They emit a lot of sounds um, in a short period of time and that's them echolocating so they can navigate their environment. Um, they wanna know if there's a tree in front of them, is there other bats around competing for, for moss? 
Um, is there a moth to the right that they can go and catch? And so what they'll do is they'll emit sounds more frequently um, as they approach objects. And that gives them a finer detail resolution of what's going on around them. So next I'm gonna show you if we could see a bat flying out at night, it's hard because we can't see very well in the dark. We can't hear them. Um, this is something what that may look like. This video also has sound. This one is not as abrupt as the last one though. So really cool video, right? You can see clearly that this bat is having a successful foraging night. It's out catching what looks like to be moss and using its tail pouch um, to actually catch the insects. So they will use their mouths, they will use their wings, they'll kind of maneuver around. And the sound that they're making is to be able to find those insects and see them using their echolocations. So really neat. Um, now, some of you are probably wondering um, when we used to see more bats, which I'll get into why we don't see as many eventually. Um, you probably may even heard about before and you're probably saying like, Laura, you're not telling the truth. I've heard about before. And the reason you have is because they do make some audible sounds. And those more often you're going to encounter when a bat is say inside your, inside your shed or inside a bat box. And so um, I have it, I have a video here of um, a friend of mine who's uh, done bat research as well, um, handling one we were trying to track its movements. And so the sounds that I'm gonna play you are some sounds that we can hear without um, kind of converting the noise using an acoustic monitor. probably hear the bugs as well. Very buggy, catching bats. <laughs> if you want to know where the bugs are, go where bats are. So, um, so yeah, that sounds like a bunch of clicks, right? So that sound I just played you was completely audible, just recording with my phone. Whereas the last two sounds I played for you were sounds that were picked up using an acoustic monitor and translated into our audible hearing range. And so that takes, there's a few techniques to do that, which I'm not gonna talk about today, but one of them is slowing down the sound, which is um, one of the more uh, common ways to translate uh, sounds that are ultrasonic these days. Um, so why, where does species ID kind of come into all this and what I'm talking about? Well, those sounds um, that researchers don't often listen to, but what they do is they take the recordings of where we were trying to pick up bats flying around and we translate them into visuals. So we can actually look at them and see the different call shapes. So if you kind of think of the difference between say a chickadee and a crow, their voices sound really different. And if you were to put those in an image, um, you can pick out some differences and some certain characteristics between those species. And so it's no different for bats. Um, they have different voices as well and different calls that they make. And so this top left is the typical call shape that a little brown bat makes when it's out looking for insects, whereas on the right is the call shape of a tricolor bat. And so if you look at those two images, you can see that the calls from the little brown bat are a lot steeper, um, and whereas the calls on the right are a lot more flat. So there's certain things like that you can look for, um, what frequency they're at, their call shape, how long the calls are, and those can really give you an idea of what bats are in, in your area as well as some of the things that I've kind of talked about already about um, like which habitats you more often see one bat and the other are some clues that can help you figure out those things out. Um, I think I'll play one of these. Ooh, that one's really loud. So that one um, is a recording I took a couple of years ago of two bats probably flying in the same area. So I see the call shape I would expect for a little brown bat. When it gets steeper here is pro when it gets steeper in certain parts of these files, it's probably when um, the bat is successfully approaching something to eat. And uh, these lower calls look like there's also a, a tricolor bat probably probably flying around. Um, I think these were taken at uh, recorded at Kejimakujik National Park as well. So putting it all together, um, what we can do. Uh, with acoustic monitors is ID all the bats. What type of bat am I seeing? Um, so some bat voices are more similar. Um, so I have here the Eastern red bat and the tricolor bat on the far left, those two call shapes there. Um, they're a little bit more similar. So sometimes it's hard to tell. Um, the little brown bat and the Northern long ear bat are C and D image in here. And so their calls are kind of similar, but there's little things that you can look for and what habitats you see them to help you figure out uh, potentially what you're seeing. 
Um, so one thing I want to point out, uh, so I kind of have all the sh call shapes that you'd expect for each species and kind of a picture by them. Um, but the time frame down here is 10 milliseconds. So if you can think in one second, how many calls a bat is potentially making. So within one second, there could be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 calls within one second. And so um, pretty amazing uh, that they can talk, they can talk so fast is what I'll say. There's also uh, the hoary bat sometimes emit sounds that kind of drop down into our hearing range. Um, I've talked to someone who said that they've heard a hoary bat before, and so that is that is also possible. And there's other parts of the world where bats emit sounds that are, are in our hearing range all the time. And so um, you never know if you're traveling one day again, um, that might be very possible. So with this acoustic data, we can get species uh, identification, figure out how many species are in an area. And then we can look at uh, where do we find those bats? How northern are little brown bats? How far south do hoary bats go? So hoary bats are one of the most widely distributed bats um, in North America. They're even found in Hawaii all the way to here, which is pretty incredible. And um, another thing we can look at is population trends, which is something that I've studied and I did as part of my master's and I'm going to um, give you a little insight to today. And so what I do with that is I look at the recordings I pick up between different time periods. And what I'll do is I'll compare the recordings I get between those time periods and see if there's more or less, um, look at different species and get a better idea about um, our bats. Are we picking up a lot of bats or not a lot of bats um, over time? So now I'm going to kind of dive into how I used acoustics to study population trends of bats in Nova Scotia. Uh, so here I have a map. Um, there's a bunch of black dots in here, and these are sites um, I studied as part of a long-term monitoring project to understand how bats are doing in Nova Scotia. And so my goal was to assess uh, trends over time, and I relied on a baseline data set and resampled um, that data set again in uh, several years later. And so there was 90 sites acoustically sampled in 2005 and 2006 during the summers. And so those sites were um, studied before bats kind of declined due to white nose syndrome, which I'll, I will get into. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar uh, with that word, and hopefully I tell you something new about it today. Um, so there was 90 sites sampled in 2005 and 2006 across southwest Nova Scotia. And those sites were, were sampled for about six to nine nights. And so what I did with that baseline data, data set is I repeated the whole study um, in 2018 and 2019 to look at how many recordings and detections of each bat I was getting uh, several years later to see um, had bat activity increased or decreased and then, and then estimate um, how bat populations are doing. And so this was a partnership uh, for my master's between uh, the Mersey Tobiotic Research Institute uh, the University of Waterloo, where I was supervised by Dr. Hugh Broders, which uh, used to work at St. Mary's University uh, in Halifax for many years, and Parks Canada, specifically uh, Kitchen-Makujik National Park. So what does sampling look like for acoustics? So we take uh, those recorders and those microphones and we put them out in the habitat of the animal we're interested in. And for bats, they love to forage over water, and that's because there's typically a lot of insects <laughs> near there. And so the baseline sampling was done by uh, Leslie Farrow, who was doing um, that sampling as part of her actual master's project. So it was kind of neat to, to redo that as a master's project myself. And so uh, the recorder that she used is called the Anabat 2. So acoustic monitors that are used to study bats are often called bat detectors. And so this specific model is from a company and they, they call it the unit, the Anabat 2. And you can see the microphone is that black little circle in the front. You can see some buttons on it. And this device wasn't waterproof at the time. This is one of the early, early acoustic devices for bats. Um, it was placed in a tub on these wooden platforms over forested rivers. And those sites were um, the ones you saw on the map on the last slide. And so those were placed there between June and August. Um, 90 sites, uh, half of them were sampled in 2005, half of them were sampled in 2006 because there were so many sites and they were so widely distributed across um, that part of the province. And they were set up to record at night um, for bad activity. And so then what I did is I repeated all of that um, on the same nights I sampled again in 2018 and 2019. So the same six nights that were sampled in 2005, I sampled in 2018. Um, at the same sites, though I couldn't actually use the same acoustic monitors. So that's the biggest difference between uh, the baseline data and what I did was that those yellow acoustic monitors here, 
are not on the market anymore. There are some newer versions, um, but that device has kind of been phased out. And so acoustic technology is quickly evolving and changing. And so the, the popular on the market when I did my study was the Wildlife um, Acoustics Song Meter SM4 Full Spectrum Bat Recorder, um, very long name. But this green device here uh, is what I deployed on poles um, in 2018 and 2019 at those same sites. And what did I find? Well, um, between my two data sets, I took all those recordings, I converted them into those nice images that I showed you before, and I ID'd all the species that we detected in all the recordings. And there was a lot of files. There was a lot of work to visit all those sites, and it ended up with a lot of data at the end. Um, if you look at the total number of files at the bottom here, there was a lot of data to look at. And so I had some pretty long days, um, both during the data collection and then looking at all of it after. And what I found was we detected both species, or we detected all six species except um, big brown bats in both data sets. But the thing I didn't expect, or I had an idea about, but I didn't know how much it would affect my, my research, was that I actually detected more bats um, and more bat activity in 2018 and 2019 of some of these species. And so that's not really what I expected because bats are being threatened by a few different things, such as habitat loss, white nose syndrome, et cetera. And so I went back to the literature and tried to find out if anyone had done this before, where they uh, compared data um, collected by different um, acoustic monitors, as you saw, like the yellow one and the green one. And what I found in the literature is that um, people had acknowledged, other researchers had acknowledged that there are differences between these devices, but how large the difference, um, I didn't really know how much that would impact my study. So what I did is I, at the end of 2019, I went and put out the, the yellow device, the Anabat and the song meter, the green bat detector, side by side to see if they were record the same number of bats um, if I put them out side by side for a few nights. And what I found was that the older device from 2005 and 2006 detected about less than 5% of the calls of this green device. And so that was uh, shocking that it was that big of a difference. So um, it's always good to keep in mind that your projects may not go as planned and then to kind of account for how you're going to deal with that. And so there was some figuring out for me to do um, exactly how to account for this difference between the technology, because I really wanted to assess bot population trends, but with this variation um, due to the differences in the equipment, um, I wasn't sure how I was going to do that. And so what I figured out was that um, this hadn't really been done in a real life scenario yet, um, was to develop a correction factor. So look at the difference between them and then correct the data set for equipment variation. And I was able to do that for only two species, unfortunately, um, but that's because when I did um, this test here where I put out my equipment side by side, I only detected those two species. So the other ones I couldn't even, couldn't even look at because I couldn't account for the equipment variation. And so taking those number of recordings that I looked at, um, in this third column here, I corrected the number of detections for equipment variation and how I got the correction factor. Um, if people have questions about it, feel free to ask, but I'm not going to get into the specifics of it because it's a little bit boring. But the really take home message is that when I looked at the number of detections between the baseline data set in 2005 and 2006 to compared to what I found and detected in 2018 and 2019 was that bats are doing really poorly. There's a huge decline still in little brown myotis, 95% decline in activity that I picked up. And then also for the tricolor bat, a decline of 91%. And so why exactly did this happen? Um, well, if you've heard over the past few years, um, you've probably heard of the disease white nose syndrome. And so between these two time periods um, is when white nose syndrome arrived in Nova Scotia and kind of was spreading across North America quite rapidly. So I have an image here on the left of uh, myotis bats with this fuzzy stuff on their face. And that's how, um, that's a really good indicator that these bats have one of syndrome. And here on the right are images of dead bats at the bottom of the cave. And so um, it was really startling because back in, in 2005, six, seven, um, mil um, not millions at the time, but hundreds of thousands of bats were found dead um, throughout those few years. Uh, and that quickly spread to Nova Scotia. So that fungus is caused by, or that disease is caused by a fungus known as white nose, known as Pseudogenonascus destructans. And here I have three pictures of each of our hibernating species. The 
left-hand one being little brown myotis, the top one being uh, the northern myotis, and the bottom one being the tricolored bat. And so you can kind of see how it grows on them. Um, it also grows on their wings and any bare skin. And it's really easily transferred between bats because they're so social. So if you've ever seen, um, I might have some pictures in here of just how bats really congregate in these large groups. So it just jumps from bat to bat really quickly. And also the fungus can thrive in caves even when there is, um, when there are no bats. So um, it loves those cold environments that bats hibernate in, like caves and mines. And so even when the bats aren't there, it can, it can stick around. And so the fungus isn't native uh, to North America, so it is an invasive species. And what it's doing to our bats here is it's causing them to be sick. They get lesions on their wings. It compromises their physiological state. And so they basically keep waking up trying to fight off this fungus. Um, but they're in a really vulnerable state because they basically lowered their body temperature to be really low and their immune system is suppressed um, because they're trying to conserve energy. And so the fungus is basically just fighting, um, fighting with them to, to kind of combat um, uh, their survival. And so bats wake up more frequently and end up dying because they can't access food resources um, as they use up their, their energy to kind of fight off this disease. And so bats during the winter are often found dead um, from this fungus because they can't, they can't find any insects or, or regain back their, their energy reserves. So some data on Nova Scotia. Um, so the fungus came here in 2011, quickly spread up through North America. I'll show you a map soon of that spread. And um, we had been monitoring uh, some of the caves. And so here I have a table of some of the bigger hibernation sites in Nova Scotia. And in the blue circle is just the declines that we saw once the fungus got to uh, the province. And so when we averaged all that, within two years, 93% of the bats declined um, at those five major overwintering sites in the province. And this was also observed in Ontario, New Brunswick, and Quebec. And so it's not a trend unique to here, but um, just startling that bats can die off so quickly in a short period of time and that high of uh, mortalities. And so because this was so dramatic, um, it led to the emergency listing of our three hibernating species because we basically weren't seeing them anymore. Um, and 93% is probably more of a conservative um, estimate with a lot of sites sometimes even being 100% shortly after. Here's what some of those dead bats look like. Uh, so this is from Karen, the top image. Um, this is probably taken in New Brunswick. And this bottom image is a hibernation site in Nova Scotia um, with little uh, brown bats um, dead outside of mine. And so I'm gonna show you now um, uh, the time lapse of the spread of the disease across North America. So just keep, that's probably just gonna keep playing through now. And so you can just see how quickly that's happened. Um, so you can just see how much contact bats have with each other. Um, we potentially contributed to that by um, some people cave, some people go and explore them and help spread that. And so just a really quick time frame for this to happen. And so by 2012, we estimated that over 6 million bats died and millions have probably died since then. And um, in the States, uh, one species was listed as well. And so um, really startling what this, what has happened. So kind of jumping back, uh, so I kind of shortly talked about my results and then just put into context with white nose syndrome and the most likely reason for why, why bats are so low right now and populations remain low. Um, one thing I didn't capture in my, in my research project though was Northern myotis. The biggest reason for that is because they're not well suited to acoustics. Um, their voices um, are really quiet. They're actually called a whispering bat. So we actually have shouting bats and whispering bats, which is funny to think about because we can't even hear those sounds. But um, for a whispering bat, that basically means that their voice is not going to travel very far. And the reason they don't need to travel their voices to travel far is because they forage in a forest. So when there's trees close by, you don't need your voice to travel very far. The trees are going to be close to you, whereas if you forage out in the open water, like a tricolor bat or a little brown bat, you need your voice to go really far to pick up on what's going on. And so this bat just doesn't get picked up well by acoustics, so they tend to be underrepresented um, in acoustic studies. 
And so with some colleagues of mine, um, and Karen Vanderwolf and Lynn Burns, we tried to compile capture rates of this species to get a better idea of how they're doing because capturing them just seems to be a better technique for surveying them. And what we found, um, which I'm not gonna go into too many details about, was that relative to little brown myotis, we think that Northern myotis is more severely impacted by white nose syndrome, which is really interesting because we have a history in the province of grouping uh, little brown myotis and Northern myotis together. And the biggest reason for that is because those features make them look so similar. So when they're on the side of a cave and you're doing a hibernaic bilum survey, they look like the same type of bat. And so often we group them together. And early on, when we first found out about this disease, we assumed they were being affected the same. And so now research in the States and this work, this project that we've put together um, to look at how they're doing is showing that this bat is um, more severely impacted by the disease and that we probably need special uh, surveys and monitoring and management techniques for them. And so um, if anyone has any more questions about what we found, feel free to ask at the end. But um, I didn't get to capture that in that work, but we are working on towards getting this information out so people can know that we need to focus special efforts for, for this bat because we basically haven't seen any um, or almost almost no northern myotis since white nose syndrome has hit. So we need more effort to figure out if they're still around and we're just not picking them up or um, are there not very many left at all, really. So with my work, um, you can kind of see that uh, from the winter room surveys early on when white nose syndrome came, it was about 93% decline, which is similar to what I found in 2018 and 2019. And so what's unique about my study? Well, here's a map of the year on um, each county uh, white nose syndrome was documented. And so I surveyed in this blue circle here. And so I kind of captured information in some areas where we don't have hibernation sites. And so we had no idea how bats were doing in that area of the province. And so that's really important. And it also confirmed the information on the specific areas we studied for hibernation sites. And so this green circle here uh, represents the area where we were doing hibernation surveys. And um, we can see that those numbers kind of align. So bats that are breeding during the summer are responding in the same way to bats that we know of, because um, think of those bats at those hibernation sites, those probably only represent a proportion of the population. There's probably many hibernation sites we don't know about. And so this can kind of capture information on how bats are doing away from those sites and potentially bats that don't hibernate at those sites. And so the big takeaway is that bats are still doing very poorly. Um, the the fun fungus is still having a severe impact on, on the population health and that recovery is going to take a long time. So bats only have one pup per year. And so every bat that you see um, is quite significant to the population um, because we need to get our numbers up as much as possible. Some unique things I found through my study because I kind of, um, yes, we know bats are not doing bad for Magnus syndrome. And I kind of confirmed that again, was that um, I found that Kijimakujik National Park was the area kind of of the highest bat activity. And so that might tell us um, a little bit about how important protected areas are and that mimicking habitats like that, that are natural and not compromised are potentially really important to some of our species at risk and maybe preventing some other species from going at risk as well. Um, the other thing that I found that had not been really studied yet was how tricolor bats are responding to white nose syndrome. And so some of the assumptions about how uh, tricolor bats were responding to the disease were based on those myotis bats. So we actually didn't have an estimate for tricolor bats at overwintering sites in the province. And that's because they're really hard to see in overwintering sites. They tend to hibernate by themselves, so not in groups, and in crevices in deep parts of, of mines and caves. And so they're a lot harder to get estimates for as well as we don't typically have as many of, of those individuals. Uh, so although I found this, um, that there was low numbers, um, we still detected little brown bats and tricolor bats across the province, even though in low numbers. So I'm gonna show you some uh, maps of the activity levels. So here are three maps. I'll just highlight what's, what's neat about them. The first one is little brown bats. So the bigger the circle, the more detections in that area that I picked up of that species. And so um, little brown myotis are still detected ag across a good portion of the province, um, lower numbers than potentially we could have seen before, but um, still across the landscape. Uh, for tricolor bats, um, I showed you the range map um, that we had uh, way in some slides before. Um, so we're still getting them across Southwest Nova Scotia, but it seems to be more concentrated in this area. 
And then for hurry bath, this is just kind of a neat thing. Um, so I looked at the literature before and found that the average number of detections we would get of migratory bats was usually around 0.4% of all calls. And what I found was I got around 11%. So that was a lot higher. And I was like, why is that? And I realized that it was biased by this one site where there was like a thousand horary bat calls here. So who knows what's going on there? It could have been one bat. It could have been 10 bats. Maybe um, a bat decided to hang, hang out there for the summer, or maybe there's even breeding going on. I have no idea, but it's um, definitely interesting to think about um, and provides new insight into potentially how migratory bats are spending their time here. So now what? Um, millions of dollars have been spent actually on trying to help bats. It's, um, it's taken a lot of time and a lot of research. I went to the North American Bat Society uh, research meeting um, in 2019, and it was really neat because there was a room full of like 400 bat researchers together. And so I didn't even know that there was that many bat researchers in North America. And so there's a lot of people dedicated towards figuring out how we can conserve bats. And so a lot of those reasons are they, they save us in millions, even billions of dollars um, for, for crops, um, for tree pests, et cetera. And so they're really important ecologically, um, as well as a lot of people just appreciate them. And so some of the solutions to compound whiteness syndrome have been vaccines, uh, altering their habitat. So how can we kind of spray it? Can we spray something on the fungus, kill off the fungus in caves? Um, can we give them heated bat boxes? Uh, currently, there is no actual solution for, for combating this. And, and people, uh, researchers have kind of tested various things, but we haven't said, okay, this is what we're going to do to combat white nose syndrome. And so it's probably going to take a variety of techniques. Um, also, just looking at how bats respond. And so some bats in uh, the areas where their white nose syndrome was first discovered have started to stabilize or even uh, increase a little bit. And so we just need to keep an eye and, and put a lot of monitoring to this to see how different species are affected. and um, potentially what we can do to help as, as humans. In the context though of white nose syndrome, I'm not gonna to talk too much about this, but just thinking about um, other wildlife diseases and how we're, what's going on with, with us right now. Um, I know restrictions have increased um, this week. And so um, I thank everyone for being here tonight. I'm gonna to get into how we can help conserve facts, but just keep in mind that other white wildlife are experiencing these um, diseases and they're relying on us to develop vaccines and do all these things and figure out how we can move through the world and prevent the spread of, of new diseases into new areas. So I've given you some tips kind of early on how to look for bats. Um, I'm going to highlight some ones that maybe I didn't point out. The biggest one I haven't talked about yet is poop. So bat poop is called guano. Um, sometimes guano is used for birds as well. And I have a really nice image here. Right below the bat box is a whole pile of guano. Um, and this is a, a bat roost um, in uh, Annapolis County um, that's persisting through white nose syndrome. And so the highest count in this bat box, I think was uh, 96 or around 100 bats. And so um, by putting up a bat box, it's really easy to monitor them because you can uh, look underneath and see if there's any guano, sometimes uh, brushing off the old guano, or putting something light helps you kind of pick up um, if there are bats there. Um, I also find that bat boxes are a lot easier to monitor than say uh, the eaves or the attic of your house because it's a concentrated area where they're gonna come, they're gonna enter and exit. Uh, so keep them in mind if you're if you're looking for bats at this, make, make it a little bit easier to monitor for them. But of course, they're not necessarily going to use a bat box if you put it up. Uh, just visually looking for bats is another thing and just being outside when bats are active. So bats are active at night. So if you've never seen a bat um, and you haven't been outside at night, that may, that may be why. But Nova Scotians are seeing bats. So I've kind of given you a sad story about how numbers are really low. Um, but we've been working with landowners and all, maybe even some of you on the call today have reported um, seeing bats across the province. And so here are some of those sightings. These are from within the last year. And so um, I'm optimistic that there are bats around and that people are concerned about protecting them so that we can kind of bring populations back. And so each individual bat is, is really important. Um, the bottom sighting here uh, from Rick uh, was just in March. Um, this bat was kind of warming up in the sun. There's a bat here on a patio umbrella. Um, there's bat roost bats roosting on the sides of the buildings. And so uh, we get some really neat reports of, of bats across the province. Just to summarize what kind of sightings we get, uh, most of the time evening outdoors, which I've emphasized, 
And most of the reports we get are where there's concentrations of people. So not that there's more bats in, say, Halifax or Kings County, um, but there's more people to see bats. And so um, this map, map may more so represent that. Today, um, I think we've had the website, uh, the reporting platform for bats in Nova Scotia opened in 2013. And so we've had over 4,500 sightings since it opened then. So that um, just gauges you how many reports we may get. And last year we got uh, just over 500. Here's a really, really neat sighting. Um, if you ever have a bat in your house, um, feel free to, to report it to us. Um, I have a couple numbers at the end for how to deal with that, just because you do have to be careful with close contact with bats because of potential uh, health concerns. This bat was found in a person's bathtub, and so um, we supported them to kind of safely put it outside and let it back out. We also get migratory bat sightings, and so often you're going to have no idea what type of bat it is, but if you do get a picture, um, like these folks did, these are from the past couple of years, um, we may be able to tell you what type of bat you're seeing. And so you can see from the, the color of the fur, um, the size, the shape of their ears, that these are not uh, the little brown bats that we see. And so this middle sighting is from uh, Cape Breton County, the left one's from Halifax County, and the right image is from uh, Queens County. And so uh, it's very possible that you could see a bat. I'm gonna finish off um, uh, with telling you about just how to do a survey for bats in the evening and then uh, some things you can do if you don't see bats because um, maybe you'll never see a bat and so I don't want you to be discouraged that you can't help. So how to do an emergency survey. Uh, so what we can do is find out where bats are roosting. So if you have a bat box, if you have an attic and you think there's bats in there, what you're gonna wanna do is go outside on a good night, figure out where they're leaving and watch them um, just around sunset exit. Um, sometimes it's a bit after sunset as it gets dark. Uh, you're definitely going to want a bug net <laughs> to help you do this. And um, the best time to do this is between June and July. Um, that's when they're having their pops in there. They're most likely going to be tied to that to that site to, to raise them. And so if you have any questions about how to do an emergency survey, please reach out to me. I'll have my, my information at the end. If you don't have bats, um, what you can do is provide really great bat habitat. So that may be leaving really nice old dead and dying trees. So some of our bats like Northern Myotis and tricolor bat, I told you really rely on those and they're not as apt to use them um, in comparison to the little brown bat. Uh, some other things is we, MTRA has a species at risk guide for free online. And so I highly recommend that you go check that out. Um, and there's some pages about bats in there. Um, and of course, reporting your sightings. Um, so here I have on the bottom right, um, how to report bat sightings. We work really closely with uh, the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative, which has put together an Atlantic Canada bat hotline since we kind of developed our website and our phone number. And so uh, we partner together to collect sightings for the whole region. And so if you have a sighting outside Nova Scotia, um, their phone number is great to call. They're also um, there to help you if you have bats in your, in your building that you don't want there, or if you had direct contact with the bat and you're concerned about uh, rabies, um, et cetera. And so specifically for Nova Scotia, you can go to this website at any time. You can call this phone number and, and leave a message if you're not calling uh, during business hours, just because most often you're going to see a bet um, maybe at like nine o'clock at night or something. Um, so I have a few more things to kind of tie up loose ends is thank you all for talking, um, coming to my talk today and just hearing about bats. As you can probably tell, I really, I really love bats and I have a lot of people to thank for um, kind of getting me on this on this work and allowing me to study bats. My supervisor for my project was Dr. Hugh Broders. Um, I had a really great set of other students um, studying bats, um, part of the Broders lab. And uh, I was also supervised by King Cummington and Matt Smith at the park. Uh, I have a lot of people at work to thank. Um, there's too many to mention all their names, um, but I also have a lot of great funders, Parks Canada, MyTex, um, provincial and federal government, um, and some others. And so I'm going to finish off with, before we get to questions, with if you want a bat box, there's a new project out, the Annapolis Valley Bat Box Project, which are actually building bat boxes that you can get. Um, there's also plans online. I encourage you to go check them out and see if you could build one yourself. Um, potentially a great project to do when you're stuck at home. And uh, if you do have a bat box, even if you don't have bats, you don't need bats at all. There's a study ongoing right now to understand um, what features of bat boxes bats prefer. Um, so there's a few different designs out there. And so if you do have a bat box, I really encourage you to, to get involved in this and think about potentially one of the ways that you can help bats, whether it's looking at the species at risk guide, 
um, putting up a bat box or one of the things I've mentioned. So anyway, I think that's, that's all I have for now if people have any questions. Perfect. Thank you, Lori. Um, if anyone wants to ask Lori a question directly, you can turn off your or turn on your mic, or you can type it into the chat window. So maybe to get us started, Lori, I have a few questions. Okay. Um, <laughs> Anyone who watches our seminars knows that I ask a lot of questions. Uh, so um, it was really cool and interesting how we could visualize and see the different types of bat calls and um, how they lined up with the different species. Um, and I was kind of curious as to why they all have different calls. Is it because they're um, eating different insects or hunting for different things? Yeah, definitely. So yeah, if you think about um, some of the features I kind of pointed about, like what habitats they're in, so they've probably really evolved those different call shapes um, to be unique to the environment that they're in and kind of be well adapted to picking up what they're what they're feeding on in that environment, but also so that they're not competing for, for sound space with other bats, right? So when I look at my recordings, I actually can see sometimes they'll shift their voice a little bit higher or a little bit lower if there's another bat around. And so um, it allows them to kind of zero in and get that information they need to, to see their environment. And so um, with the migratory species, their voices tend to be quite loud. Uh, they fly a lot higher um, and they fly a lot faster. And so uh, features about their size probably also play, play a big role in that too. Very cool. Um, so Sarah asks, is there certain types of wood you have to make your back box with? Oh, um, so they don't recommend treated wood, and that's because of the smell. Um, they think it will uh, make bat bats not bats not interested there. Um, but they do recommend that you paint it. Um, if you guys want, I can actually send some links into some recommendations for bat boxes, or you guys can just look them up um, on the Canadian Wildlife Federation and Canadian Con or Bat Conservation International site. But um, definitely not treated wood um, is best. Um, just so that they, they have a good sense of smell actually, so. I think everyone would like if you shared the links in the chat. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Um, and then Amanda asks, is there any way to check for bats in an area acoustically um, on her own with uh, less um, professional equipment? Mm. Good question. So the, definitely the cheapest device I would say right now is the audio moth. But I think that acoustics is something hopefully to, in the future for bats, it can become a little bit more accessible just because it is a lot um, to learn. I think I had a big learning curve when when I was kind of starting out learning about, about studying bats. Um, if you have any questions, I could help you maybe, but I think the audio moth is probably the cheapest device, but it does take a certain level of expertise. And so um, I think probably a bat box is a little bit more uh, friendly to, to someone without that expertise actually, and monitoring that. So another question is, is a bat rocket similar to a bat house? Um, so this person works at a wildlife park and they just received a few of the bat rockets and they want to make, um, and they're not sure what they are. Okay, yeah, I'm pretty, I think I, I think I know what you mean. Um, so there's a design of bat box called the rocket box. And so what's special about those is, I always describe it this way, is that they better mimic a tree. And so there's actually roosting space kind of all around. Whereas uh, more traditional bat boxes and some of the pictures I showed you are really flat boxes. So they they have like a few slots inside. And so these boxes are really great because they um, provide more space for them to move around as the sun kind of changes throughout the day. So if they're in a spot that's too hot, they can potentially find another side of the bat box and kind of cool down, um, which is really important with pups because uh, for about three weeks, they can't fly and they're, they're solely dependent on the, the female adult bats. And so... Um, that's great if you if you have those and those are a great option and hopefully through that kind of study I have here on the slides um, we can learn more about how important those bat boxes are just because in some warmer climates it's shown that those um, when you don't have those those roosting space options um, it can be detrimental to uh, to young bats. 
Uh, Sarah's wondering if you can buy the uh, bat rockets. Good question. I'm, I don't know the answer to that. Um, there's definitely plans online and there may be a website. Um, be careful though, because sometimes they're really expensive and it'd be so much cheaper to build them or to find someone uh, you know who can build them. I was talking to someone on the phone, I think like two weeks ago, and they said they found one online for like $100, which is quite a bit of money. Um, I think Canadian Tire sells the flat the flat boxes um, online. I don't know if they're in store, but um, I'll have to look into that. I don't have I don't have an answer for you. If anyone else knows if you can buy a rocket box online somewhere um, that's not super expensive, please let us know. Dilbert asks, has there been any work done in Nova Scotia involving stable isotope analysis? Yes. Um, so I think the only study that I really know of, um, oh, Batman, I see the link to the bat management. Um, okay, I'll jump back to that after. Uh, so for the isotopes, um, one study was basically trying to figure out if um, bats from across the province were all going to those overwintering sites that are kind of in the middle part of the province, like Hans County way. And so what they did is they looked at, did a stable isotope analysis of their, of their diet to see if uh, bats from summering sites were also uh, eating kind of the same things at those overwintering sites. And what they found was that bats are trying to traveling across the province to some of those sites. And so um, stable isotopes is kind of give us into some insight into how um, bats across the province may be also traveling to those overwintering sites. So Sarah is- um, I see the, the uh, rocket box um, link there. Um, I think that management uh, is a good site actually. I think they have a variety of plans. I think they even have plans that you have to pay for for like a giant bat condo, like a big bat house. So. Has there been any talk of uh, breeding programs for bats in the province? Um, well, so I think right now we're not actually even allowed to rehab bats. So if you did find a bat that was sick, I don't think, I think there's restrictions on being able to do that. And that's probably related to rabies, even though there's actually a really low uh, incidence of rabies in bats. Um, so you're more likely to get it from other wildlife like raccoons and foxes, but of course, keep it in mind, like I have to work with bats, I have a rabies vaccine to handle them um, as part of research. Uh, so there has been no talk of breeding programs. And I think the, the thing with that is that those bats wouldn't be resistant to white nose syndrome. Um, so they, so by breeding them, it wouldn't actually necessarily protect them from, from the fungus. And so we need to pretty much promote bats that can kind of combat the fungus naturally probably and kind of promote um, healthy bat populations through that way but maybe it is an option um, i know in other parts um, there's like a big rehab facility for bats in texas and i know there's bat rehab facilities in other parts of canada that will that will help bats but um for breeding i don't think that's currently one of the the solutions that we're really looking into investing a lot of research in Good questions. <laughs> uh, Lori, I have another question. Uh, you mentioned that northern myotis needs healthy forests. And I wondered if mm -hmm. you could just elaborate on that. And what does a healthy forest look like for a bat? Um, OK, so I don't have a number for how many roofs um, northern myotis would use. But in like one of the research projects in Nova Scotia for the tricolor bat, they kind of studied the movements of 40 bats, 40 female bats, and found that they used around 99 trees as they tracked them for a couple of months. So I think um, that kind of speaks to um, the connectedness um, and the number of roofs that they require. And so they use a variety of different trees, northern myotis, um, deciduous trees, like um, maple trees, et cetera. They can use a variety of trees. And um, they like to be in like older stages of decay, kind of mid stages of decay. So not, not fresh young trees and really large trees as well. And so I think a healthy forest for them looks like offering some of those um, 
some of those stages where the trees are getting older um, and there's lots of lots of those trees so that they can kind of find the right spot um, because they use a network of roosts and not just one. And so the other thing is that uh, for bats, they tend to use the same roost uh, year to year. And so a healthy forest probably looks like uh, retaining some of those some of those trees long term so that they can rely on those roots. Okay. Uh, Amanda asks, have you found any bats that are resistant to white nose syndrome? Yes. Um, I don't know if I can use the term res resistant, but um, there's there's some tolerance that's been shown. So um, we don't have our finger on it yet exactly what mechanisms they've evolved, but there are bats that seem to be surviving the disease better now. And so that might be due to an immune response. And we just basically need more research on like what those mechanisms are. Um, one thing that we do know is that bats that have like a higher fat reserve. So um, jokingly, people will say fat bats uh, handle uh, making it throughout the winter a little bit better. Um, so that's one one feature, but those like underlying immunity responses um, are, are things we're looking into more. But it seems like there there potentially is some resistance developing in those bats. So hopefully, any bats that are surviving are going to kind of pass down those traits and have more bats um, in the wild that can kind of persist through the disease. Um, uh, Wendy asks, "Will you be doing any more bat monitoring?" Uh this is a lot of work. It tired me out. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, so we're we're doing it. <laughs> it was a lot of work. <laughs> um, all those sites and all that data. If you saw, there was like over a hundred thousand files from from this project. So, yes, we're going to be doing more monitoring. So, if you are someone who thinks they have bats on their property, please feel free to reach out. Um, we really want to put a lot of effort into like supporting people to monitor bats themselves, um, and kind of be more aware of a lot of the things I talked about today. Um, we're starting to support the, this project called the North American Bat Monitoring Project. So for other animals like birds, we have like the Christmas bird count, um, the breeding bird survey. We haven't really had programs like that for bats. And so we're trying to support having that program um, in Atlantic Canada so that we can kind of have long-term monitoring data and not just random studies every few years kind of capturing specific little, little things. So yes, more monitoring. <laughs> Um, and Lindsay asks, why would you want to paint a bat box? Uh, so bats like it where it's warm, especially for their pups. So it's more uh, conducive for them to, to get pregnant and give birth. Um, and warm environments are better for the pups as well. Um, I guess maybe that might be confusing because I said, don't do treated wood. And then I said, paint the bat box. So just paint the bat box on the outside. So I understand why that's probably like, why would you do that? Um, so they recommend in Canada, because we have colder climates, that having that dark box, sometimes they're brown, sometimes they're black, um, really attracts the sunlight and helps warm up the box. Um, so I think we, we do need more information on that. So that study is really important to have as many people participate as possible to get a gauge on, like, is that really important for us to keep doing that um, kind of in Nova Scotia? But yeah, I understand your question now. <laughs> um, Janice asks, where's the best location to put a bat box? Uh, so the higher up, the better and on buildings. So some people try to put them on trees, but it's actually better to put them on buildings. Um, and as high as you can um, is, is better for them so that they're not close to the ground. Uh, sometimes there's certain predators that bats may have or like raccoons, cats, um, owls. Uh, so putting it up high. Um, there is some stuff about putting on certain sides of the building, but it actually seems like sometimes bats don't necessarily follow um, those recommendations. Bats kind of do what they want. And so um, putting it in a spot where it gets off the sunlight, um, close to water and high are probably the top three things I would recommend for, for bat boxes. Uh, Ryan asks, for counties where the fungus is native, um, how do bats deal with it or do they not hibernate? For counties where the fungus is native. Oh, okay. So like in spots where bats have evolved with the fungus. Is that maybe the question? I think that's what it Yeah. Means. Okay. So that, yeah, I think um, no bats in North America have kind of evolved with the fungus, but in Europe, 
um, and China, they, in Asia, they found, um, the fungus there and that, uh, those bats have kind of co-evolved with it. So they actually don't die off and get sick like what we see here. So, so that fungus came here and bats just didn't know how to cope with it because they, they haven't evolved the mechanisms for it. And so, um, it seems like one paper I read, uh, speculated that, um, one of the big differences between bat colonies in Europe versus here is that we see them in much larger numbers here. And we think that maybe potentially because we see colonies of bats in, in Europe not as high is maybe because they've evolved with that fungus, it's kind of kept bat numbers low. So maybe something we could see here in the future is bats rebound, but we just don't see them in, in larger groups as we used to. If that doesn't answer your question, let me know if you have more specific questions about here, like the map where we didn't have the fungus identified, let me know. Um, Lori, I was a little curious about what the status of our migratory bat species were. Like, are they in decline as well due to other factors or are they doing well? Yeah, so good question. So it seems like our migratory bats are more affected by wind energy. So the, like, especially the hoary bat is kind of like the number one species that comes up when we think of wind energy studies in, in other parts of North America where they're more common. And that's because they're migrating and they're kind of going through those wind turbines. And one of the biggest things that wind turbines do is that when you get close to them, the pressure change is so drastic that it basically kills the bat. And so those species are migrating high and fast um, to get to warmer climates. And so they're, they're really impacted by that. So I think I don't have estimates on the numbers. I can't remember what those are, but a lot of bats have died. Um, from wind turbines. And so there's been a lot of research into figuring out um, the timing of wind turbines. Can we slow them down? What things can we manipulate? Because wind energy is so important and we're, we're kind of moving in that direction. But for white nose syndrome in these bats, they don't get sick from it. And the reason for that is because they're not hibernating. So they're not going to this state um, where they're lowering their, their body temperature and their immune system is repressed. So they just don't get sick from it. But they do have um, the cases where they can detect the fungus on them. So sometimes they are transporting it, but they're not getting sick because they're not, they're not hibernating. Do researchers have an idea about how climate change, climate change might uh, be impacting bat species? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's not much research on how bat climate change is affecting bats in Canada. Um, I think there is research in other parts of the world where um, the impact is more apparent and I don't really know much about it. Um, I guess just thinking about um, here and like the timing of when insects kind of come out um, with when bats leave hibernation is probably really important. So um, that would be a really interesting study just to look at how the, the peak time of bats kind of coming out in the spring, um, is that timing changing with then when bats emerge from hibernation. Okay. I'm just getting the last link. Um, I realized I just sent the other one to you. So thanks for sending it to everyone. Here's, um, now we have both links in the chat. Um, I just tried to quickly do them while I was chatting with you guys. Um, for uh, the Canadian Wildlife Federation, they even have like a checklist of what to do for your bat box, which is really great. And then um, they have kind of the more flat chamber bat boxes, which aren't bad. Um, if you're really enthusiastic, I recommend actually putting up a flat box and a rocket box um, if you have lots of time on your hands. Um, but the rocket box can be found at the, the second link that we have in the, in the chat. I'm just going to turn on the light. I have my computer plugged in there, so I can't. Um, is there any more questions? Okay. I don't think anyone has any more questions. So with that, I'd like to thank, thank you again, Lori, for this awesome presentation. Um, I'd also like to thank the region of Queens for supporting um, MTRI seminars. 
and Venture for Canada for supporting my work here at MTRI. We will not be having a seminar next month, but you can stay up to date with MTRI, our projects and staff, as well as our future seminars by following us on Facebook and Instagram. And if you missed anything from tonight's uh, seminar or you'd like to watch the seminar again, you can stay tuned to our YouTube page where we will be uploading the seminar and all future seminars, usually within a week of them going up. So with that, we hope everyone is well and we hope um, we get to see you all again very soon. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you.